Today's show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. My savvy fans secure their internet. Join them at expressvpn.com slash yang. I guess I really got in my own world. I didn't think his name would be that big of a meme. So like when it became like a giant meme, I was like, oh, like I already fucked my kid. I think it behooves most any adult who wants to understand what's going on with the younger generation to try and spend a few hours on TikTok. There isn't like a tech safety community that's super large. Like it's quite small. You're supposed to be a tortured artist or whatever, but it's like, it's actually kind of um, edgy to be wholesome at this point. Artists have the same impact on a community's economic development as entrepreneurs. The situation in music worries me. Like I know artists that are pretty successful that are like broke. I'm, I'm like super into brutal, brutalist architecture at the moment. And I thought like brutalist baby, like, you know, like a, just like a square cement crib would be kind of cool. Welcome back to Yang Speaks. It is election day. It's election day 11 or whatever it is. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> election day 11. Election week two. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's sad. Uh, That's sad. Uh, so I, I'm getting a lot of questions, Zach, about, hey, like, are these Trump legal actions going to actually uh, succeed? Should we be concerned? I understand why people yeah. would be concerned because you, you'd put nothing past um, this administration, but it's a wrap. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, well, that's what this, I wanted to do. Is... I wanted to like let's. I want to debunk. I want to get to like facts of the recount nonsense, voter fraud nonsense going on because it's mostly nonsense. But uh, if you're a game, I'd love your thoughts on what's real and what's truth right now because the source of truth to me is a moving target right now. Well, the the, the truth is that Joe has a. Uh, margin of victory in Pennsylvania, Georgia, uh, Arizona, Nevada, um, that, that's high enough uh, that it's going to make a recount like impossible to succeed, Wisconsin, uh, where I think it was Scott Walker, the Republican governor of Wisconsin, who said, look, we can make a mistake of 100, 200, 300, maybe 400 votes. We're not going to make a mistake of 20,000 votes. <laughs> you know, like, you know, it's like we know how to count. Um, and this is a Republican governor. Uh, and, yeah. you know, so who's been pro Trump in some ways, you know, or yeah, anti Biden, so, if you will. Like a lot of these states have Republican secretaries of state, Georgia, Republican secretary of state, Pennsylvania, Republican secretary of state, mm -hmm. like they're the folks. So, uh, so what's happening is you have very hyper partisan impulses being like, it's a fraud, you screwed up. Uh, and then when the, the show will be like, OK, like what evidence are you claiming? They'll like just snatch some strange like, you know, account or video that um, most often gets explained away um, or accounts for, you know, like maybe like one to ten votes where you could be like, OK, maybe like that, that. But like there, there's no uh claim of like and then they dumped twenty five thousand fake votes in there and put it like you know like there's, there's nothing uh that would influence the outcome of the election so here's what's really going on um the republicans know they've lost but they need donald trump's voters through january 5th the georgia special elections which we'll talk about and uh you and i are heading to georgia um Yes, sir. Shortly, so that's that's exciting. Not to vote um, ourselves, to help other people vote. I'm gonna say that. Yeah, yeah, times. just to draw attention and raise money and rally, but uh, you know, that's not not going to. That. Yeah, no, it, it really is. It's like it's like like that. There, there's like a. Yeah, it is not Andrew Yang's fault or my fault that Georgia's laws on voting residency are ridiculous. Apparently, you can move there and just register to vote. That's ridiculous. Not our fault. Not our plan. Keep going. Yeah. No. Exactly. <laughs> Take it up with the Georgia State Legislature. So. Uh, so the Republicans have reasoned that they need Trump's voters January 5th. Um, and so they're going to play along with the entire Trump, uh, fraud game, um, because they just want to maintain energy levels because they think if Trump's just out of the picture and he concedes, then all of his supporters will stay home January 5th and the Democrats have a better chance of winning these special elections. 
Um, but I, I think you said, Zach, that what's telling is that Trump and Pence are essentially on vacation now. You know, they're like chilling. Like everyone in their administration uh, is looking around being like, uh, okay, I guess I need a new job. And then um, the, their leadership is like, you have to pretend that everything is still normal that will be here and if you don't then we'll fire you before even like <laughs> like uh um you, you can leave so so that that so that's the situation it's cynical it's political like a lot of things in american life um and uh it, it's trying to maintain hold of the senate january 5th so here's my thought on this stuff is would that make sense to me um and then for those of you like, because I think disinformation becomes a problem when rational Republicans who are not the diehard base, but like rational, moderate Republicans or moderate lib libs on the, on the other side, start to parrot what the far right or far left is saying. And I think that's what's happening here. It's really frustrating because I have, you know, your rational, either rational pundits or rational friends of mine. They're like, well, there seem to be some shenanigans going on, which is frustrating because here, here's what's up that. I like recounts. So if like the Republicans want to just say, hey, we want to recount the votes. Fine. Totally fine. We should do that in democracy. So I'm 100 percent on board. We did it. We've done it before. We'll do it again. But here's the. The counts are Biden's ahead by 20,000 votes in Wisconsin, 145,000 in Michigan, 13,000 Arizona, 14,000 in Georgia, almost 50,000 in Pennsylvania. So some of these are close, but not a couple signatures and, off. And close, note, even if there know? was a freakish thing where one of them gets overturned, Joe still wins. Like you, you need to Correct. overturn several of them. Yes. So Bo, uh, Joe essentially needs three, maybe two, depending on how you, which ones you pick here. I think in Pennsylvania and Georgia, I believe it's over, right? By the math. So um, the other thing is there has been, this is the other fact of the case because Republican lawyers and judges, generally speaking, 99.9% .9 of them believe in the rule of law. And they're looking at this, not a single judge, a ju all judges have thrown out the cases presented to them that have been at the scale that could flip the election, right? Because like there's the no evidence of it. Have been accepted, it, it, right? it's the clearly only ones just that have been like accepted a, are the small yeah. ones. Yeah. So that's, there's no real evidence at all of voter fraud. And that is frustrating. This election is big, guys. It happened. Joe Biden got more votes, both nationwide and the states he needed. He's the president elect. Donald Trump's on the way out. And um, the Republicans would be acknowledging this to a much higher degree if not for the special elections in Georgia, in my opinion. So, uh, uh, you know, you're like, probably right. So, so, so just keep in mind that like they, they see the there's an incentive uh, balance of power in the Senate as potentially at stake. And then that's made them much more willing to play along. Right. And that makes their life hell, comparatively speaking. Right. Like they have a lot of incentive to want power in their power in the senate because then congress actually can do stuff um well democrats the, need you know it's like yeah republicans well, need, both the, them, right? need the yeah. leadership yeah i mean they both need it yeah yeah um let me ask you this i think this is a fun trevor noah had this point which i don't always love trevor noah but sometimes he's funny he said uh so on one hand this um claims of voter fraud are hurting democracy and our trust in elections and something you've talked about a lot on the other hand, on a more fun hand, there is a chance we see Donald Trump dragged out of the White House, which I think would be funny from a comedy standpoint and an entertainment standpoint, which I think is Trump's lane. Like, I think he's an entertainer to me. Thoughts on that? What you'd rather see? I imagine I know where you land. Um, but have you thought he's about He's not going to let us get dragged happened? out. He, he's he's going to okay, walk out walk. of there like the, the day before and do a photo op and like hop in a helicopter or plane. Um, Give us the bird yeah. and flip us the bird and then have that. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. I think and, you're probably right. And then millions of Americans will continue to support him. And then, you know, we'll see what his yeah. future holds. Um, yep. Uh, the, the, the problem really is like the muddiness between now and then, because still he's the president between now and then. So he's firing people. He's making decisions. Uh, he's, fired you know, the, secretary, he's fired his secretary of defense, right? Who said, yeah, uh, the, and I quote, uh, if it's a yes man, God help us all. Yeah, the and the uh, the transitions getting gummed up because ordinarily um, the Biden team would have some resources to work with and be talking to current officials and a bunch of other things, uh, and that that has not happened. So that's uh, that that's negative substantively for an effective trade off of uh, or handoff of power, um, and that sucks. You know that I mean, this there's no bones about it. Like this. Like we just hung on through this, and like it's still happening. 
where you have, like you said, I guess, formerly reasonable Republicans being like, oh, like, let's let play this out. Like, it's bad for the country that the incoming team cannot talk to the current team. Uh, it's bad for the country that millions of Americans are being called to, like, question uh, the objective fact of who got more votes. Like, like, this stuff's really destructive, and it's speeding up. You know, it's like the norms just held together uh, for this one. Uh, you know, next time, if the next person says this stuff is rigged, like, you know, you, you might see uh, uh, unrest and, um, uh, like, worse judging or, you know, whatever the heck, uh, you know, it, it is. So, like, this is not going well uh, for American democracy. Uh, you know, like, I'm, I'm thrilled that Joe and Kamala won, but, uh, and I, I wish that, you know, Republicans didn't have these political incentives to cast this, like, alternate version of reality, uh, where clearly, and, like, all these Republicans are being like, oh, they're, they're like, issue shenanigans, they could do a recount. If Trump had won, they would be crowing immediately, being like, you know, it's in the bag, stop it, like, we don't need to count more, like, the rest of it. I mean, you saw it so clearly where, like, the chant was different depending upon what state and what the needs were. It was like, stop the count, or count every vote, or whatever it was, you know, you know they'll, yeah. like, flip on the dot. It's a tough um, argument, because there's so many states, yeah. Uh, so, there, I mean, the, the, the core of it is just that they want their team to win, and, um, and that's, in some ways, understandable, because we all want our teams to win. Um, but, you know, at, at this level, like, there, there has to be some degree of um, country over party. You know, it's like, th this stuff is really bad for the country. It's bad for the country that an incoming government, like, can't talk to the current government. It's bad for the country that, like, you have this floundering executive branch for, you know, two solid months. Like, you know, th like, there, there are just real, real negatives to this. Um, and... and uh, like I, I don't I think this hand holding of Republicans who want to play along is uh, is is corrosive. You know, like I, I wish they didn't feel. Uh, but I, you know, I guess it's like the epitaph to the Trump era. It's like, well, we kind of wish Republicans had separated from him this entire time and been like, yo, this guy's you know not the guy, and they never did. And so they're still playing it out. They're still riding his Trump coattails to what they hope is political victory in Georgia. Uh, country be damned, you know, it, 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 um, like, uh, it's a sad day or a sad week or two weeks or three weeks or whatever it is. You know, you've talked a lot. I'm going to find this quote, this quote and tweet it before this podcast where you found, you said, we're entering an era. I think you said this at CNN town hall, your first one, where you said we're entering an era of, um, the lack of institutional trust where we don't trust our schools. We don't trust our our military, we don't trust our education system, and um, we don't trust government. And now it's looking at like we don't trust our elections. We don't is trust the, the media. Final straw. We don't trust well, media. Yeah, There's like, a whole bunch on this list. Yeah. Yeah. I, actually, Zach, military is the most trusted of those institutions you just named. Like, uh, <laughs> uh, so the, of course I butchered your quote. That's actually a good example. Yeah, no, no, it's. I don't mean like, <laughs> like the, the military is like the, the last bastion that gets like point. majority <laughs> trust. <laughs> Uh, we don't trust hospitals, we don't trust doctors, yes. don't trust, you know, it's like the, 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 the trust is low. Um, the trust is declining further still. This election, unfortunately, has not been good for trust. You've talked about this before, but I'm, I'm, um, we never really debated it. So there's there's liberal chatter um, and, and not like far left stuff it's like Politico wrote about this, where um, there's rumors that Trump will have um, some civil suits and possibly face jail time from um certain courts when he leaves the White House. Um, and you've been on record saying you hate that because that turns us into Venezuela. And I agree with that. No, I, um, I, I'm saying I, think, I hate go ahead. I hate criminal prosecution. Um, the civil suits have added, you know, he owes you money, yeah, go for told. it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know I mean? um, like, I, I do think it's bad practice for a new government to like throw the previous president in jail, uh, you know, because that's a pattern that goes on in uh, developing countries where like the new president's always trying to like chase down the uh, former president who's still a potential threat. Uh, yeah. And I, I know there, there are going to be many people who disagree with uh, this because they want to see Trump in jail really, really badly. Uh, like I, I think it would be, um, I would think it would do more harm than good to try to imprison Trump. And, and I also think that Again, just like the odds of seeing him dragged out of the White House, the odds of him actually going to jail would be so low. You know, he would just decamp to another country where he would uh, um, mm -hmm. live it up. <laughs> right. Yeah. Nope. But I do think, like, if he owes money, like, particularly the New York 
um, lost, civil suits lost have suit added. On tax he owes you money. He owes you money. Foundation. Go for it. Like, come on. You know, here at Yang Speaks, we are all about protecting our data. I am so thrilled that Prop 24 passed in California. Californians are enjoying higher data protection rights. They're gonna create a new data protection agency just for California. And if that sounds cool to you and you're not in California, then go to your state legislators and say, hey, how come Californians have better data protections than we do here in Wisconsin, in Michigan, in Ohio, wherever? Let's have this sweep the country. In the meantime, if you want to protect your personal data every time you use the internet, we recommend ExpressVPN. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. It's like you beam into the internet from someplace else. No one can track what you're doing. They can't sell and resell your data. It's like you're a ghost, a spy, someone really cool from the future who no one knows what the heck they did. If that sounds good to you, ExpressVPN is your product. Visit expressvpn.com yang. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash Yang for three months free with a one-year package. This is the number one rated VPN by Wired, CNET, and The Verge. Visit expressvpn.com slash Yang to learn more. So, uh, just, so let's, get to, let's get to Georgia. Why is everybody going to Georgia over the next call two months? You had uh, not one, but two Senate races in Georgia, which is highly unusual. And uh, neither of the quote unquote winners or front runners got 50%. So in Georgia, there's a rule where if you don't get 50%, you go to a runoff. So race number one is John Ossoff against uh, David Perdue. And uh, that was close. It's a two point race or so. Um, John Ossoff's very young, very logical. Uh, really impressive candidate to have um, uh, accomplished so much. Uh, I talked to him the other day and he was joking about how when he ran for Congress, it ended up being like the most important congressional race of um, the year because it was the first one post-Trump. Uh, and then now his Senate race is becoming the most important. So he, he's, he's yeah. like joking. He's like, Poor I guy. just lightning strike it twice. <laughs> uh, and, and then the other race um, is... Reverend Raphael Warnock against Kelly Leffler. And both Purdue and Leffler were accused of insider trading on coronavirus information. When they first found out how bad the coronavirus was going to be, they did what any American would do and adjust their stock portfolio. <laughs> they were just like, oh, this is going to be bad for cruise lines. You know, it's like, that's leadership. That's leadership. Uh, and, that's and so illegal, by the way. It's so, having worked on Wall Street, that is like textbook insider trading there's not like that's not even a gray area yeah the, the, the entire um legislative access to tradable information i mean come on like we haven't figured this one out like if, if you're gonna show up in congress just like put your money in a trust they like throw it in a bunch of things you can't touch it and then you come out of public service you get it back instead we're, we're creating all of these gray areas where legislators are freaking profiting um, it is not a good look that folks enter congress non-millionaires and leave millionaires on the regular you know like like that that's and it happens all the time all the time and it makes sense because there's it's not illegal to do this you go in and sit there in a meeting like wow it looks like this massive xyz problem is causing oil prices to skyrocket in the middle east like oh better like get out of my oil companies and you go in there and you make your trade and then let it go and then yeah you don't lose all that money and like there's a moral like take care of your family thing but it's highly illegal it's not cool um well yeah so, i mean congress hasn't hasn't like uh, slammed the door on this stuff to the degree that it could that it needs uh, to right it needs to for sure um i mean it'd be illegal in some of these other contexts you're talking about um so <laughs> yeah like all the depends but there needs to be rules and like insider trading's hard um to track in general but this one's easy this one's easy well, Zach, I'll, I'll tell you, the enrichment of congressional uh, members is not strictly that they just have better intel and they're like, you know, like adjusting their um, e-trade portfolio or something oh, like that. Oh, do like, tell more. Like, like, do tell more. Like, mo you know, no, most, of, most of it is that you get in there and then all of a sudden, like, people just want to include you in everything, including things that, yes. um, that can make you some money. And they're Correct. technically legitimate. Uh, but just people will be like, Hey, you know, like we've got some real estate deal. Like you want to come like, uh, partake and like, there's not no rule against it. You're like, you know, a citizen, you can 
uh, invest. And so people will just be like trying to carve out awesome opportunities for you. And then before you know it, like, you know, you're trouncing the market many, many times over. If you're a member too, you're like hanging out with rich people all the time. And, and then the, the rich people kind of put their hand on your shoulder and they're like, they're there. Like, we like you. You should be rich like us. <laughs> you know? and, and, then, uh, yep. and then, and then and then the is. members like are like, yes, I should. And then before you know it, they are. Anyway, this is actually a long digression from the fact no, that it's very that, real, man. And I'll say this quickly because I saw this. Like, if you have people always like the rich get richer, like poor get poor, like. When you have money, the investment opportunities get a lot better and a lot less risky in the sense that in 2000, I'll never forget this, we sold an Apollo European credit fund. Awesome idea. And basically in the 2009 financial crisis, all like the smaller banks, mid-level banks in Europe went under. So private citizens, if you're like the Cisco, which is like the food delivery service, super blue chip company, you couldn't get a loan in Europe. So private citizens just pulled a bunch of money together and were loaning like blue chip companies at like 11% interest, 15% interest. It was the closest thing to a surefire bet ever. And all you had to do was have enough money to lock it up. So it's stuff like that, that they're getting access to where you and I, like you're, you're poor, you don't, you're not in the game. You have to invest in just an Apple stock or whatever, S&P 500 and like go with those waves. These guys get sure things if the lead access, that kind of stuff. So long way to getting there, but that's just one that I remember very, yeah, man, you, I'm like, wow, this yeah, you lived a it. brainer if I had money. You know? Yeah, and then they'll call you up and be like, "Hey, have I got a thing for you?" I so got Kelly Leffler, you. yeah, and then you're like, "Sure, you feel smart, and it's corruptive over time." Anyway, Kelly Leffler uh, is the richest member of the Senate, which is saying something because there are a lot of freaking rich senators. <laughs> but Ke- Kelly Leffler, Leffler is worth 520 million. She's already put 23 million into her race. Uh, Reverend Raphael Warnock, uh, you know, is, is a, a black reverend. Uh, very inspiring. Like uh, in, he's got, getting a lot of support. Um, I, and this, I'll just say, just because I think it's fun, is that Kelly Loeffler also owns a WNBA team uh, that, like, and all the players wanted her to sell it because she she was against the Black Lives Matter messaging <laughs> like on the court. Like you know, it's like you probably should do everyone a favor and sell that team if like your players don't want to play for you that way. So uh, so that's that that's the other race. These are fascinating races and. Uh, we have to be realistic that for Democrats, it will be an uphill climb. And you think, well, why? Because didn't Joe just win this state? Like, isn't Georgia a purple? The problem is that uh, Republicans in Georgia have a much tighter read on um, voting and the need to vote uh, than Democrats, who many of them are new to the process. Um, and this was true a number of years ago, even there was a special election that was very close to get to a special election. It was maybe a three point gap. And then the Republican won it by double digits, maybe 12 points. So that was a number of years ago. Uh, so it's probably not going to be that gruesome this time. Uh, but you have to expect that uh, Democrats uh, will come out at lower levels. Um, and the Trump not being on the ballot thing cuts both ways. Is that they're like, you know, Republicans are concerned that their voters will stay home. You know who will stay home? A lot of anti Trump Democratic voters in Georgia. Uh, so it's a it's an uphill climb, uh, but we have to to make this happen because the alternative is Mitch McConnell saying no to everything for four years while the country sinks into the mud. Uh, that that's why I'm heading there and you're heading there is that uh, we have such massive problems in this country, and we know Washington will take any excuse not to work. You know, if the party can just look and blame the other side and be like, well, nothing happened, no stimulus bill, uh, it's their fault, vote them out of office and then go eat a steak um, while, while the, you know, the country is burning, <laughs> they'll do that. You know, That's I mean, that, like, that, 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 like, 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 I mean, we're seeing it, we're feeling it. Um, we've, so we've already it, felt if, it for seven months. Yeah, for seven months. So if you want uh, to get things done out of Washington that might help people, a unified government would be enormously superior to Mitch McConnell saying, no, no, no. And Mitch McConnell, all of a sudden, you know he's going to be like, oh, the deficit. Like, when, like, no one cared when Trump was like, let's do a, like, trillion dollar tax cut. be like, yeah, let's, you know. <laughs> like, For all the Republicans that voted because of the fiscal situation in the United States to decrease the deficit, it went up exponentially essentially donald trump had the biggest increase in the deficit in a long time i'm gonna see if i pull those numbers up but go ahead so it's bullshit it's a bullshit argument uh, like and if there's any time you're going to deficit spend 
It's when you have a pandemic and a pandemic induced recession and a jobs recession and like, you know, like people uh, are getting kicked out of homes and in food bank lines. Like if there's any time you're going to deficit spend, it would be now. And one of the things that frustrates the heck out of me is the confusion around where the money is going. CARES Act, $2.2 trillion. Uh, if you do the math, $1,200 for, let's call it 100 million Americans, uh, is something like 6% of $2.2 trillion. So it's like, oh, all the money went to people? No, <laughs> you know, like a, like a tiny sliver. went. Like you could give everyone $1,200 a month for a year with like that $2 trillion if you so chose. Which, by the way, would have been vastly superior to what they did. Because let's say you have an airline. I feel, I feel very deeply and desperately for all the families, you know, the furloughed employees and the rest of it. But let's say that all those employees were getting like $1,000 a month, $2,000 a month. And then the airline itself was getting recapped. Like, then how would you feel? We only care about the airline because we care about the workers. We care about like the pilots, the airline attendants, like the, the rest of it. It's like, I don't want those people to suffer. Yeah, no, like I don't, I don't want those people to, to suffer. It, you know, the other thing is like, we have a sophisticated enough corporate um, infrastructure where like a bankrupt airline will just keep on flying anyway. You know, you know what I mean? They'll, like they'll go to the creditors and be like, well, I can't make any money if we're not doing flights. And they'll be like, yeah, yeah, you go do that. Like, it's, it's not like bankrupt firms just stop operating. You know, like the, 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 the creditors can just keep on, uh, you know, like doing the thing. So, so there, there are many, many better ways to go. So even if you are concerned about the deficit, you should be clamoring for cash relief because it is the most effective bang for your buck. It would actually go right back into the economy. It would rejuvenate small businesses, keep some of these restaurants open and, and all the rest of it. Um, and, and so having Mitch McConnell talk about the deficit is something I will desperately, I will fight tooth and nail to shut him up. Just be like, look, just, uh, you know, like just step aside. You've, you've done enough wrecking of the country for a, for a while. Uh, you know, like let, let's try and rebuild it. Yang versus Mitch. I'm excited for this for, so those just to make sure I get the numbers right. Um, this is according to a site called the balance, which is like a pretty, I've read this before, but a pretty good, uh, us debt. Uh, blog website. Um, but we've increased the debt by Donald Trump, under Donald Trump, been 36% or so, almost 36% in the past four years. Now, you could give a chunk of that, kind of, not all that is COVID right now. A lot of that is the tax cuts. And there's this logic on the right that say, hey, if we cut taxes, people will make more money without the taxes and then they'll still make it back. And the reality is, really rich people don't pay taxes. So this is a ridiculous model. Um, so, that's our world right now. Um, and then to be clear on this, if the Democrats win these two Senate races, we have a 50-50 tie in the Senate, which means a tiebreaker goes to the sitting vice president, which means Kamala which is Harris gonna be Kamala vote. Harris. So so, so then we you have know, a 51-50 advantage. So would that not be glorious? That's what's on the line in Georgia. That's why we're heading there. Uh, we've just kicked off uh, winbothseats.org. Uh, which donates to 16 community organizations that activate voters uh, in Georgia and in different places and different uh, communities. Um, so we've identified this as the most effective use of resources. Uh, it's a two-month sprint, and so you need people that can actually talk to people. Uh, and, uh, um, and these orgs uh, do just that. They're actually very close to the ground. Um, so... Uh, you know, we're going to go there too, knock on doors, like uh, do some things. I'm going to try and activate some people while I'm there. It's been fun where a lot of people have reached out to me being like, hey, you're going to be in Georgia. Like, you know, let, let's get together. T.I. tweeted you, which is hilarious. Um, yeah, Martin Georgia, Luther King right? III, um, like uh, said, yeah, let's get yeah. lunch. I mean, like, you know, the, it's it's like, oh, there's like a, a beautiful, yeah, there's a beautiful welcome wagon um, um, in, in Georgia, which is a great place. Dominique, like freaking love Dominique. Oh yeah. I, Dominique. We'll see him in Atlanta. Dominique Wilkins. Um, so a couple of things. Um, I'll say this again. I keep saying it, I'm just, I, but I do think it's important because a lot of the right is, is, is like screaming this narrative, if you will, where Georgia has some weird residency laws. And let me say this before, if you move there, you can pretty much vote pretty immediately. Um, which is, uh, not great when, um, you know, it protect potentially for election fraud. But if to think of how that would actually work, where people actually move, get a place, and then move out for an election, it's not going to happen at scale. But that's not the point. We are going there 
to help the campaigns, to help the Democratic Party, to get out the vote and register new people to vote. Um, so that's what we're doing. More to come. I mean, guys, we've now turned these campaigns, which are probably, what, 30, I don't know the numbers of time, 30 to $50 million operations each. Now it's going to be combined hundreds of million dollar operation where the whole na nation is now focused on the state, whether they like it or not. So a lot is up in the air. Um, we're figuring out what we're going to do. All we know now that we're moving there and we found some great orgs to work with and so TBD. Um, it's also COVID, which we'll talk about a little bit on this podcast. So the in-person campaigning, not as fun as it was back in Iowa in January. Um, but let me ask you this, Andrew. I think this is really important because um, a lot of people see you, I like to call your lane the rational progressive, right? Where you're not far left, but you have really big ideas um, and you're not afraid to talk um, to criticize both parties. You clearly are a Democrat. You are lean left on a whole bunch of things, um, almost everything, but you also um, are very rational and thoughtful. Um, not left or right forward is kind of what, you know, that's been our slogan. 70 million Americans voted for Donald Trump. There is a, to me, it's also a healthy sign that um, we're not all, like the country's very divided. So what are you, you're right now very supportive of giving Joe and Kamala full reign of the House and Senate, which is why we're going to Georgia. Do you mind explaining like why a little more? You touched on a little bit, but why are you, even though there were so many Trump supporters here that we saw it wasn't a mandate, why you're so passionate about the the full control for Joe? I, I understand that there are some people that are like, ooh, you know, both parties, um, checks and balances, compromise. Yeah, it'd be like, nice you know, to have you, the balance. You, you yeah, it's kind of you, you don't want to give everything. Yeah, like I understand that perspective. Um, I think we're in a very specific situation right now where we have a pandemic that is getting worse, not better. Uh, we have a three to four trillion dollar hole in our economy. Uh, something like 40 million plus Americans have filed for unemployment over the last period of time. Um, and, and so the government needs to be taking fairly dramatic measures in order to uh, stop the bleeding uh, and fill that hole and provide a path for tens of millions of Americans. Uh, now, if you look up at Washington's recent history, uh, it's not great in terms of taking the actions I'm describing. Um, but the track record plummets when you have Mitch McConnell um, playing goalie or obstructionist. So if we lived in a world where the Republicans and Democrats have been working together harmoniously and like hammering out legislation, and, and then uh, you were in this crisis and you had confidence that they would come together, uh, then maybe, you know, it's like, okay, like that, that, like that, that might make sense, but that's not the world we live in. Like we live in a world where uh, we haven't gotten another relief act in seven months and counting, and it's probably going to be, you know, unfortunately, like significantly longer because they're not going to pass the law in the lame duck session. Um, uh, and in this circumstance, you need an invigorated government actually doing things. I know it's painful for some people to hear, but that's where we are. Half of independent restaurants are going to close without some kind of relief. Like, think about what that means for communities around the country, for uh, the, those jobs, those people, those families that freaking spent a lifetime building that restaurant, put their heart and soul into it, and, and now are, are going to be forced to shut it forever. I mean, like, that's what we're facing unless our government actually, uh, uh, like, passes the Relief Act for restaurants, small businesses, puts money into people's hands. Like, the, the deprivation and desperation are rising uh, and this is not the time to be like, uh, like the, the bipartisanship you're talking about is an abstraction. Like, uh, like the reality has been sorely disappointing for years and years. Uh, and so if we're going to get some kind of real action out of Congress, we have a much better chance at it. Uh, if Mitch McConnell, uh, is not the final say. I think that was extremely well put. I think the other to me where I look at is you start to give Joe options because Joe can go to Mitch, say, hey, I'm willing to negotiate with you so you can get your moderate Republicans on board with a bill that all Americans get behind. But if not, I'm going to force something through like that to me is what um, a reasonable president can do. And I think Joe will be. So that is why we're going to Georgia. That's why this matters. Um, once we have details and you can or you um, get off your butt and get down there. But if not, also like we can phone bank, you can text bank, you can fundraise. There's, there's a whole bunch of virtual things you can do as well. So this is where the focus is. With that, we have a um, really special 
guest, man. This is like, we've been excited about this for literally Grimes. six months. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, I'm such a huge Grimes fan on a personal level and a creative level. She's just a powerhouse. Uh, we met on the trail, um, uh, stayed in touch, uh, and she became a mom. And, you know, I dare say, you know, like, uh, um, that... Um, she's been uh, fairly low profile since. So like this was like a special treat uh, on several levels. But I just like, I just love uh, talking to her and she has so much to offer, uh, a lot of insight. I think the world right now needs more art and uplift uh, and that stuff's underestimated really. Like, you know, you talk about politicians um, trying to be a source of that. But I think artists are a more consistent source of that in the vast majority of people's lives. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, if you want to feel good, like, what do you do? You probably turn on your favorite uh, artist. You turn on your favorite music. Like, you probably don't turn on, like, old Obama speeches or something. Um, you know, maybe you do. No, Some people they do. don't turn to Yank. <laughs> maybe they laugh. <laughs> oh, no. Maybe they turn to Yank Speaks. I don't know. Uh, um, so, but you're right. Yeah, uh, it's music. Yeah, so yeah. so just learn a ton. Of, but more importantly, just, like, um, felt a real sense of joy uh, getting to catch up with Grimes. Uh, I hope other people enjoy this conversation too. So thank you, Grimes. Hope everyone enjoys it. Uh, it was a treat for me. Yeah. And look, she doesn't do a lot of these. So it's a rare moment. And, um, I learned a lot and I think, um, you guys are gonna enjoy it. So tune in Grimes joins Yang Speaks. Here at Yank Speaks, we are all about doing things better, doing things more efficiently, doing things more environmentally friendly E. Uh, and this comes down to things that we do every single day. What could Yang possibly be talking about? I'm talking about bidets. Have you been to another country and been like, wow, what is this device? Huh? Uh, like maybe they figured something out. They have figured something out. They figured out how to, uh, to clean our tushies every single day in a way that's more environmentally friendly it's more on point it's uh you know it takes some getting used to <laughs> but uh but it's it's a better way to go and most of us aren't at a point where we're thinking "Ooh, like i'm gonna install one in my home so you know who has you covered tushy has you covered because it's like an add-on they stick it on an existing toilet just any standard toilet and all of a sudden it's like insta bidet and it modernizes you. It makes you more environmentally friendly. It'll make you more sophisticated. It'll make you more European. Actually, what am I talking about? I think Asia is really more into these things than anyone else. So if this sounds good to you, check out Hello Tushy. Go to hellotushy.com slash yang to get 10% off. Special offer, hellotushy.com slash yang, 10% off. Hellotushy.com slash yang. It is my thrill to welcome to Yang Speaks award-winning musician, visual artist, creative extraordinary Grimes. Welcome. Oh my gosh, Grimes. It's so great to see you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. How's it going? Thank you. It's going it's going 2020 good is what I say, you know? It's like I I can't complain, but the world is terrible. <laughs> you know, I mean, the world is a little bit less terrible now that Joe has uh, defeated Trump and is heading toward the White House. But uh, that that election, I know you and I uh, texted about this, like it, it didn't leave you with a positive feeling. <laughs> no, it was, I mean, it was definitely a high stress situation, I think. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. But I don't know. I feel like there are lessons to be learned from this. Well, for you, you grew up in Canada. Does American politics uh, horrify you, fa fascinate you? Like uh, uh, from someone who grew up uh, in our northern neighbor, which, which seems like a more rational <laughs> uh, place in many ways. Um, yeah, like like how do you experience American politics that way? Well, first of all, I feel Canada isn't actually as rational as everyone thinks. Um, you know, we are the home of the crack mayor. Rob Ford. Um, so, oh, yeah, that guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, who, like, got caught smoking crack and then got caught smoking on video and then got caught smoking crack, like, again and then possibly, like, a third time. So, you know, it's like we, we really we're, – we're not that much better. 
And actually, Canadian politics are, I think, a bit more crazy than people think, just because we have a kind of like a three party system. So a lot of the times the more kind of, I don't know, woke vote or whatever actually gets kind of split between the liberals and NDP. Um, so Canada actually has its own problems, but, um, uh, you know, which often leads to a conservative uh, government. We, we still have like healthcare and uh, like our college is massively subsidized, which is like it just actually does make a huge difference in quality of life. You're you're so. a, you're a product of that, right? Um, because Canada's universities, uh, including the top public universities like McGill, are essentially cost free. Yeah. And I think yeah. like you attended, uh, was it McGill or like uh, the, like one of the Canada's big schools? Yeah, no, I attended McGill, which is literally like a fantastic school, like almost for free, like a couple thousand dollars a year or whatever. Um, and I'm deeply grateful for that, even just because you can kind of not know your major going in and stuff. Like, I feel like in America, if you make the wrong choice with your major or career, like it's it can be like a hundreds of thousands of dollars mistake. Hundreds um, of thousands of dollars in debt. Yeah, it's true. Yes. Yeah, so it's like, I mean, that's just I I, I, I don't know. I, I kind of didn't fully comprehend the situation until I came to America and met people. And it was like, damn, like I got to like try out a few different things before I you know, chose my major. So I think this um, is one of the main reasons we think Canada is more rational is that your education is paid for and you're not taking 18, 19 year olds and loading them up with debt and then stressing them out about making <laughs> life decisions yeah, where they should be decisions. exploring. Yeah. I mean, I like did not know what I wanted to do at 18 or 19. Like, absolutely not. Um, you know, so, uh, well, actually I did want to be a musician, but um, I didn't think that was a reasonable career path to pursue. Um, so it ended up working out. But yeah, no, it's like, it just seems crazy that you should be saddled with an insane amount of debt for decisions you're making before you even really know who you are. Before your brain is fully wired. Seriously, it, it's highly nonsensical. Uh, and people are paying for it here. So you knew you wanted to be a musician. Did you have a sense of the medium? Like, uh, did you think I, I'm, I know it's going to be electronic or like you know uh you, you'd be the vocalist or did you dabble with instruments or what was the story there um I actually never made music because I didn't think I could or should um and then but I was just like an obsessive music fan like super 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 obsessive um and then actually in my neuroscience course or I was in a uh I was sort of studying music in the brain and we actually had a class where we had to learn logic and like make a song overnight and bring a song to class the next day to prove we'd like learned the um audio recording software um and that's when I kind of started making music because I I like it, yeah the class provided free audio software and then I just sort of like went down the rabbit hole whoa um, that. that is wild yeah. uh so yeah. what what year uh in college is that how old are you that would have probably been 2009 or 2010 um and then I basically the first music I made kind of went viral uh which was both both a blessing and a curse because like there's a lot of footage of me like it, literally learning how to make music. I've been making music for less than a year and I'm like on stage and stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's some yeah, um pretty awkward awkward video of me like being like, "Uh, I accidentally turned the uh SP404 off. Sorry guys." And people but um yeah. So well, well, certainly at that point, your career starts taking off and, you're, and uh, you end up making a, a career move, which anyone would have in, in your uh, position. I think the most fascinating thing about your music is that it really feels like you're transported to another world. Like I actually... Have you actually listened to my music? I have actually listened to your music, but I will confess to you, Grimes, <laughs> that like if, if I just listen to your music... Um, I feel like I'm not getting the right experience. Like, I feel like I have to be watching the video in order to, <laughs> to be, is, like, I'm not sure how many of your fans feel the same way. But I mean, I, I, I kind of feel that way. So I don't know. I'm, I, I'm glad you feel that way, I think. Yeah. Yeah, because you're, you're such a visual uh, artist and there, there are such striking visuals. Again, you feel transported to another world, but like a lot of your... Um, your videos and songs. And so I, I feel like they all go together in a way that makes them more complete. Like if I'm just listening to the music in a car or whatnot, 
like uh, I, you know, I just feel like, although let me wait until, you know, I can be someplace and, <laughs> you know, like watch the video on my phone. I, I mean, I, I don't know if that that's uh, everyone's attitude, but for whatever reason, that's the way uh, I've experienced your music. I mean, I'm usually thinking of um, videos, like almost all my best songs. I like, I was like, ooh, imagine if this, I'm like, imagine a scene or something. Um, uh, Cause I direct a lot of the videos myself or co-direct them with my brother. Um, and then kind of make the song around that. So um, it, it is, I, I think, core to the music. And speaking of the Canadian government, um, part of the reason I was able to even do that in the first place, like being super small and on an indie label was the Canadian grant system, which America is maybe too big to have art grants. I don't know, but that's another thing that I super appreciate about being born what an what I mean I I didn't know this but what an incredible story you're like the product of the public education system and then you had some kind of uh, art grants to make some of your first videos that helped launch you um so there are programs like that in the United States but not in the way you're describing I don't believe like anyone who's an artist listening to this is like I haven't seen an art grant in my life in the United States <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. like the, the people who are saying that are generally correct um, there, there yeah, is a national yeah. endowment for the arts, but it would not go to an independent musician that's trying to make a video. Like it, it might go to a museum or an art display. Um, not that there's anything wrong with those things. Um, but that that's an incredible story of the government coming through. <laughs> I know that's, that's why I'm like, I mean, if you look at the Amer American music in general, like so many of the artists are Canadian or Swedish or whatever, you know, like I, I do think there is, you can like, see a direct correlation between the grant system and public funding for the arts and, you know, um, like, I don't know, whatever the weekend Bieber it's Drake, you know? Um, yes. yeah. I, I was just um, at a uh, Saturday night live. Um, and I was hanging out with Jim Carrey and it just struck me that he's another, uh, super, oh, yeah. <laughs> super Canadian who like came down and took over <laughs> you know, showbiz. So it's true. Like they, um, Canadian influence is very strong everywhere. Uh, one of the things that I found out when I was running this entrepreneurship organization, Venture for America, was that artists have the same impact on a community's economic development as entrepreneurs. Like if a bunch of artists move to a community and then you wait X years, that community will end up having uh, economic growth, new businesses, revitalization in the same way as if a group of entrepreneurs went and this is a major problem for the United States because in the United States, uh, arts are treated not as an economic driver, but as something of a luxury or frivolity, uh, in yeah, part yeah. because of what you're describing where you show up to college. And then anyone who says they're going to study art or music would be like, are you out of your minds? And, uh, you know, people, yeah. get, people get funneled towards, quote unquote, these more practical things. Um, when, when in truth, and you and I talk about this, like in the future, we have to be investing much more energy in arts and creativity uh, because AI and technology are going to do a lot of like the bookkeeping and accounting and like the practical stuff <laughs> that that, yeah. that that people feel like is a safer career. I mean, a, a lot of this stuff is going to change pretty quickly. Yeah, I'll, although I do actually think like at least music is democratizing really fast um, in part due to the tech companies like, um, you know, GarageBand being free on an Apple computer or whatever. Um, you know, I, I actually like I think you can actually record like I, I think like Billie Eilish said she recorded her album in her house or whatever. Like it, it is the technology is kind of getting to a place where I think in uh, it's just getting a lot more democratic. Like you don't need it used to be that you need to be just really fucking rich or on like a label that's going to spend, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to make an album. And um, I think it's interesting because you're just seeing the amount of artists making music ballooning right now. Um, which is cool, but then it's its own drama. Cause I, I was actually just talking to Daniel Eck um, who runs Spotify and they're like, you know, there's 7 million artists on Spotify or whatever. Um, and like, they feel like they can like maybe make it so that like a million artists can make a living off music, um, which is still not a lot. Seven million. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not 7 million. And pro and probably it's gonna like double, like it's, there's probably gonna be more than 7 million. Um, but I don't know. Like, I wonder, I mean, I know you're really into like UBI and stuff. Like, I wonder if there's ways to, like, if everything is automated, like if there's sort of AI and machines kind of like doing almost every sort of menial job or whatever, like, is there a world in which 
if companies aren't paying employees, they can like tax, they can be taxed more like because of all the extra, in theory, all the extra revenue they'd be making while not having to pay. Um, yeah, but not having to pay <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like, you know, could that be like, I don't know. I, I'm actually curious about like UBI. Like I haven't read that much about it. Like I'm not like, like, I don't know what the specifics would be, like how it would be um, accomplished or whatever. Uh, I'm really passionate about a lot of elements of this where right now, so, and, and you know this much better than I do, and you're like an ultra successful popular artist, but a lot of artists are dependent upon actually performing live and touring in order to make yeah. money, make a living. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, Even me, kind of. Yeah. Yeah, for for you too. I mean, like you you understand uh, this better than I would. But uh, the digital royalties from like a Spotify are really really pretty minimal, even for folks yeah. who are getting tons and tons of downloads and views. Like I, I forget what the math is, but it's something like a I don't know, like a tenth of a penny or some, something ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, like, like maybe you get a few cents. Uh, and so there are artists who might get millions of downloads uh, who are struggling to get by. Because, you know, it's like, yeah. it's actually, yeah, it's, it's pretty insane. I mean, I wouldn't say it's um just an issue with the streaming services. I think of late, the labels are a huge part of this too. Um, I mean, in music, there's just a lot of middlemen, like, you know, once you have like, you know, business management, lawyer, manager, booking agent, label, personally, I think labels pay too much, but at the same time, um, you know a, a label is also can also throw a lot of money down on an artist and it can fail so it's like i'm not really sure what the solution is but i i do the situation in music worries me like i know artists that are pretty successful that are like broke um and that's not right yeah. you know like the, the these yeah. are folks who are uh like people with millions of, millions of plays like they're like popular artists like so it's it's yeah um I feel like we need to sort of like do something about the middleman situation, but then I like, I don't, yeah. There is a cost structure where you have uh, an industry that came of age in a time when there was a lot more money flowing through. Cause I'm old enough to remember going to tower records and like the CD stories and whatnot, <laughs> you know, that they were like buying this. <laughs> don't know. A lot of times you were buying an album for like one or two good songs too. It was like, you know, like that, yeah, that, that yeah, was like yeah. the way it was packaged. Um, so you do have some legacy costs. Um, uh, another big problem, though, is that we've conditioned consumers to pay one uh, streaming fee, and that's it. You know what I mean? It's like if I paid for Spotify, then I want all my music for free. Um, and then, yeah. the, and then the only way you can get more money out of them is to show up in their town and perform, which is okay. I mean, now it's not okay because no one can perform. Um, but I, I think that there, there. So one of the solutions I had. Um, and you can imagine this as like universal basic income. So universal basic income is the government giving everyone money. And if we did that, then musicians would make more music and they wouldn't be starving to death and people would have more money to patronize them and, and, and support them. Um, but I, I think the move we have to make is something where we empower consumers to pay artists directly just by uh, virtue of listening to them or, or having their attention. Like every American has like a hundred uh, music bucks or media bucks that they have in any given month. And, and by virtue of them listening to you, you actually get maybe whatever the streaming, like, you know, pennies are, but you get like a micro fraction of that person's music bucks for that month times all of the folks that listen to it. And then all of a sudden the money that goes to these 7 million artists in Spotify, like goes up significantly. This is like a revved up version of these public grants you're talking about, where instead of giving it to the artist, we give it to the consumer so that when the consumer uh, listens to a musician or supports a musician, then the musician gets rewarded. Like you would need some kind of system like that, which is actually very doable. Like, you know, it's much more doable now than it, than it would have been in another time. Yeah. Or even, you know, I was listening to a podcast. Do you know the Revolutions podcast, Mike Duncan? Um, I don't listen to it, but I, I've heard it's, of it. It's an incredible podcast. Um, but you know, it's like, he, he seems to like stress. It's always just, and like Harry's razors and all this. And I'm like, why can't there just be a donate a dollar? Like, why can't I just buy Yes, it? Just was, donate the dollar. And like watching like, artists scramble for this stuff too. And be like, Hey, support me on Patreon, support me on this and that. It's like, you know, it's like, if I enjoy your stuff, you should just be getting value from me. I just feel like <laughs> every streaming, like every single streaming service, like even like YouTube or 
whatever Spotify, there should just be a little thing at the side of like the song yeah. or, the podcast or the video. And it's like, I just want to donate a dollar to this. Cause another thing that I was thinking about a lot is music videos, for example. And I know you wanted to talk about K-pop, which I think is sort of anyway, so like the, the music video masterclass at the moment, but um, <laughs> yeah, they've, they've taken it to a whole nother level. It actually reminds me of your stuff where it's very transporting, but go on. Um, but you know, it's like, so music videos, there isn't a direct, um, uh, you don't directly profit from a music video. You like pay for a music video and you just like hope to God, like it makes the song take off or whatever. And that you can like earn the money back on the video. And like, I think this is, it's kind of sad because it's like, I feel like the art of music videos would be respected more um, if like you could pay for them in an easier way. Like when I see a fucking fantastic music video, I'm like, damn, like, why can't I just give them two bucks or five bucks? Like, you know, um, there are so many problems that are tied into this. But one problem is that our attention is being monetized in various ways. We're conditioned not to pay, yeah. but then we pay this hidden price because you're selling ads and you're selling my data and you're doing all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like particularly yeah. in the social media world. Uh, I mean, a lot of this music we're talking about is on YouTube. Like freaking, you know, YouTube tries to monetize us through ads and, and they've got very effective algorithms and rabbit holes. Uh, yeah. and, and some of that stuff's not great. You know, like there, there's a joke that you're always three clicks away from a conspiracy theory on YouTube. <laughs> like, yeah. like, like, like you'll yeah. start out watching a video that you'll wind up, you know, watching some crazy video about pizzerias or whatever. I, I don't know if this is like a proposed idea, but I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Like, you know, I feel like under capitalism, like we value things that we pay for more than things that we don't pay yep. for. Um, yeah. And, you know, like, do you ever get into like that? Um, am I the asshole page on Reddit? It's like a page where people like they they come and they like say they they're like okay, am I the asshole? And they like say their situation, and like there's so many of them with like you know like a stay at home mom, like you know where the husband or whatever is just like like you're the stay at home mom. It's an easy life, like blah 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 blah. Like everything is paid for, um, like chill. Like you're not allowed to complain. And you know I really started thinking about the fact that motherhood isn't compensated. Um, and it's this weird oh thing. Oh my gosh, yes. Like it motherhood is. is the hardest thing in the world. And so, everyone treats it like, like, like it's, it's so it could, hard. It's like, not, it's brutal. It's way harder than a regular job. Like as a person, like yeah. I thought I was like a hard ass, like touring and, you know, just like, like it, when you're just like alone with a baby for 24 hours, like you can barely go to the bathroom. Like it's crazy. Like there aren't other jobs where it's just like going to the bathroom could just be like a huge problem and like, you know, like sometimes you're just holding a baby in your arms crying and you're like, I just need to pee. Like, ah, you know, it's like a really intensive job. And I feel like people, our society super undervalues it. And, um, you know, it's actually one of the most important jobs. Like it's like raising the next generation. What does Canada do for new moms? Because Canada has paid uh, leave and whatnot. Uh, the U.S. is the most pathologically anti-woman and anti-family. And when Evelyn had our first son, Christopher, it was so difficult uh, for both of us, but primarily for her, because when, yeah, you're, yeah. when you're the dad, the baby doesn't care about you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> like, the, like the baby's homed in on mom and food. Yeah. Uh, and like the dad, like, you know, I, I was um, in the way uh, a lot of the time. Um, but seeing what Evelyn went through and then trying to help and being, you know, not, like uh, um, not, you know, like as much help as I wanted to be. Um, uh, it's so educational, like because uh, I saw what Evelyn was going through where like the, the baby um, needed her 24 seven. The baby did not sleep more than, you know, what I, I forget what the rhythm was, but it, like, hours, yeah, hour, like slept like... an hour. And then, and half the time, even when it was sleeping, it was sleeping on top of her. And so, you know, she was like kind of half asleep. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, 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 the baby. And so she was just getting, um, yeah, it was so punishing. Um, and imagining a single mom go, going through that uh, really broke my heart. It's actually why I ran for president because. I was cocky going into it. I was like, there are two of us and we're, you know, like we have resources and the rest of it and like, it should be fine. And then it was like a bomb went off in our house. Uh, and like, we both were losing our minds for months. Uh, and I just couldn't imagine someone going through it alone. You know, that's the, the main thing, like two or three days in, I suddenly had this insane empathy and like deep concern for single mothers. Like I was just like, Oh, Holy fuck. This would be like, like really, really bad if you were, doing this on your own um and like i think you actually might be 
you know, people say single mom and this and that, but it like, that's like a really fucked up thing. I, I think, and I don't think it's a society like we're considering that nearly Not enough at all at all. Cause it's like, it's, yeah, the level of brutality there is like crazy. If you, yeah, um, going through it alone as a single mom and right now, 40% of American children are born to unmarried moms, uh, you know, and then some really? of them, yeah. So, so some Damn. of them, it, like some of them, it looks like they're, you know, they're two parents in the homes. They, happen not to be married but uh in in many of them uh it's just a mom like it, it it's yeah. the new normal really in the u.s uh and it breaks my heart because like now I, I regard every single mom as a super woman superhuman uh about 90 percent of single parents are single moms too so when you think single parent you're like there are yeah. single dads out there but they're outnumbered by single moms like nine to one yeah. Well, uh, I mean, any, any single, single dad too. I mean, if you're, you know, you're in the same boat really. So, um, but I just like, I don't even know how you would have a job and have a baby if, and like not have another person. Like I literally can't, like, what would you do? Like, what would you do? Yeah. I totally like, agree. Like it, it's <laughs> unfathomable. It's yeah, pretty uh, scary. So. so we're talking about it now, but how is, um, like how, how is, is it X Ash A12? Like how did, did I pronounce that right? Or. I say X A I Archangel because, but uh, there was great dispute, um, <laughs> I think around the world and in my house, because <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> His name is Malleable. Um, I don't want to talk about him too much because I'm like really in the like wanting to de celebritize him. I, I did. I guess I really got in my own world. I didn't think his name would be that big of a meme. So like when it became like a giant meme, I was like, oh, like I already fucked my kid, and it's like. No, don't worry about it. He's got plenty of time to become um, uh, aware. Trust me, I, you know, I've got two boys and they don't know what the heck is going on even now. And they're like, you know, yeah. five years older than him. <laughs> so you're fine. Don't I worry about it, it. I feel like it's like a consent thing. Like a baby can't consent to being like famous or whatever. So I'm like very cognizant of, yeah, trying to yeah keep his life normal and not have him be like a celebrity baby or whatever. Um does he have but, a does he have a the beginnings of a personality like is, is he doing his thing oh yeah 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 definitely i mean i think that's what's crazy like personality seems almost there from day one more like day 20 but you know yeah. well one of the yeah. things that happens when you're a parent uh, you'll probably agree with this i think uh is that before you you have children and you get this like nature versus nurture debate um, you think like oh it's like they're both really important it's like 50 50 and then after you have kids you're like nature <laughs> yeah, no, totally, uh, totally, totally. Like, like, ex, like, you know, yeah. Like, he was smiling and um, like reacting to the helicopters and stuff like weeks before he was responding to people, and I was like, oh, okay, yeah, he's uh, obsessed with aircraft. This seems uh, <laughs> like the old block. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, no, but it's it's. I mean, because he just his personality is fully, fully like he just. He has his vibe and he's, it's just there. Like, I don't think we could change it. Like, he enjoys what he enjoys. He literally has taste. There's music he hates. Like, there's music he loves. Like, it's just, like, fully set, you know. I'm sure I'm sure you could, like, yeah. No. yeah. Well, I have the same um, experience where, you know, like, our, our boys are very, very specific. And that has nothing to do with anything we did. You know, like, they're, they're, um, so parents think it's more nature than nurture. And... Apparently science agrees. Apparently science <laughs> says okay. there's, there's a lot science of. Does agree? Yeah, science does it agree. It's a bit more nature okay. than nurture, um, so it's not our, our imagination. Angie and I want to talk to you about something called Noom, which is basically a psychology-focused way to lose weight, get healthier, get your mind right. Getting in shape, quote unquote, is something that we all say, but it doesn't actually have to be about losing a specific amount of weight or a magic number on the scale. It's about these healthy habits and feeling better about yourself, which is why the psychology is really important. So if fitting into your favorite pair of jeans is great, but there are many reasons you might want to practice self-care and every person's different. So for me, uh, I find that at least on the trail too, when you're eating like crap or you're traveling a lot, you're working a lot, like the energy starts dropping, your sleep gets a little inconsistent, uh, the desire to have an alcoholic beverage too often uh, creeps up. So this app and website and program Noom is pretty powerful. And what you do is you take this quiz 
And we've actually done a fair amount of these types of quizzes, but I really like this one because it's not just like, hey, what's your weight loss number? It's like, what's important to you? What are you struggling with? What are you uh, passionate about? How busy are you? What is bothering you? It's just stress levels and eating, it's nutrition, it's digestion, whatever it is. Um, so you create this quiz and it takes like three minutes or so. If you take it a little more serious, put more thought in, it, probably have five to six minutes. And when you're done, you get this plan. And it's 10 minutes a day of either focusing on your diet or physical activity or meditation or whatever you think is, or whatever they determine is helpful for your efforts and for your plan. And so for me, I am on a get in shape plan by middle of January, which includes a little bit of working out and a little bit about diet adjustments. And I'm just getting started, but I've loved it so far because it's simple and it's not trying to hit a home run on your first at bat, like a lot of times when I get back into working out. I think things like Noom are the future. Noom represents the, the best application of technology to actually make us healthier, happier. Sign up for your trial today at Noom, N-O-O-M dot com slash speaks. Visit Noom.com slash speaks to start your trial today. So you just had an album come out. Um, the the creative process, I can't imagine what that's like for you. Uh, you know, I'm like, I, I have uh, a couple of things that I work on, but like for, for you, I feel like you have to be absorbing uh, images and music and just consuming culture in a particular way, because then at some point you're going to produce a video, an album. And there, there was a quote from you that I loved. It was something like, I don't want to just be the face of this thing I produce. I want to build it. Like, it sounds like you really have your uh, your el your elbows deep into everything that you're doing. Um, so I feel like to do that, you have to be this kind of sponge where you're synthesizing um, art and music, um, you know, maybe, maybe not all the time because everyone needs a break, but like, I feel like that must be uh, an important part of your work. Yeah, no, uh, I think it's, yeah. I mean, I'm just like constantly obsessively consuming new music and, um, you know, books or movies or whatever um it's really important to me it's it's actually like one of the reasons i did the i don't know if you saw like the i, I recently released an app that's like an ai um yes sort of oh, i wanted to talk about this it was like yeah. um like the, the digital avatar uh, that people could use uh is no, no, it's, a it's, it's a different it's like it creates ai it's like an ai music generative thing that makes oh, like, different. um audio for babies um, but part of the reason I did it is like all the baby shit is so, I, um, uh, I just feel like it's not good art. Like I find it like distressingly obnoxious. Um, and like, it was stressing me out. Cause I was like, man, I can't keep like engaging with all this bad art in order to raise my kid. Cause it's going to make me a worse artist. And also I feel like it'll make him <laughs> worse taste as well. Um, but that is so on uh, point because you just end up uh, exposing yourself and your kid to this kind of crap for kids. <laughs> Some kid stuff is great. Some kid stuff is great. Like I, we were watching Fantasia the other night and I was like, wow, Fantasia is a masterpiece, like an utter masterpiece. I have you seen that movie, the Dis old Disney movie. Oh yeah. The old Disney, Mickey mouse, the brooms, the whole thing. Yeah. And did you know what Fantasia was made in 1944? And if you watch it from the lens of the war, it like completely changes the whole thing. It's like, yeah um great film but um so i mean there's some i mean some kids content is in my opinion some of the best content there's also just a lot of I, more like the baby stuff like getting babies to like open their eyes and th you know you know like all the little cards where you show them the black and white thing to try to get them to learn how to focus like i feel like that stuff is just feels weirdly mass produced and not very artistic um and i'm like man this stuff could be it just could it could be prettier and Crime, more beautiful. crimes if you wanted to uplift that you would be doing the world such a massive service uh because every parent goes through this where you look up and you're like okay like how old is my kid what am i supposed to be doing and then like you you know like go online and like buy some products and you you bring them in um and a lot of it is not as uh human as it could be or should be like that like there there is not a lot of heart and soul in a lot of it uh, that, that yeah that, yeah so if and I know this in part because Evelyn went through some similar processes and so what she did is she had like a scratch pad of product ideas um, and the the funny thing is that 
um, by the time you turn to the product idea as a mom, like your kid has aged into a need for another product. Yeah. And so you forget about that one. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, my brother and I had this really funny one that like no one would ever want. Um, but do you know, like brutalist architecture? Yeah. Yeah. Like, so it, it was called brutalist baby and like everything would just be like cement, like hyper minimalist. Um, there's no, some parents that would be into that for sure. I feel Especially like the, in the I, yeah. world we're in now, they'd be like, oh, this is going to make my kid more rugged. <laughs> maybe it's like bad for the kid, though, to be maybe it's sort of like pr prison esque. I don't know. But yeah, I'm, I'm like super into brutal, brutalist architecture at the moment. And I thought like brutalist baby, like, you know, like a, just like a square cement crib would be kind of cool. Uh, well, one I'm of the things kind of you and I, you baby. and I were were bonding over, which I, I I think we need in the world, is that we need more public art. Like, and one of the fun things about ah. you is like you're continuously like posting kind of visions and images of of various uh, structures and sculptures that that uh, should or could exist in the world. Have you been to Burning Man? I have not. I have many friends who've been. I take it you've been. Yes, it, and like the thing that struck me the most about about it is it's just like art everywhere and it's just like it just feels amazing to just be walking through and there's no there's also no um obviously sound restrictions so it's just like every ha half a block there's just like a whole new audio experience and there's just like beautiful art everywhere and i'm just like man if like imagine if our cities had this much like if you were yeah. just allowed to go make something and just put it there without all, all the bureaucracy and paperwork and like you know like even i wanted to like mural my house or like paint it black or something and like i had to go through the city council and it was like a whole thing and i was like okay fine i'll just have a normal house like if I, you know because if it's going to be such a trial <laughs> it's going to devalue the neighborhood and whatever then fine I, I won't like have a cool house but like like that's you can't even like mural your house we should um, be able to mural our houses uh in, in all seriousness i think public art at a bigger scale would be really transformative because right now one of the problems with america is that we're uh, cynical about our ability to change and evolve uh you know and and that's something around yeah. like a level of optimism and um appetite for change in a positive way and i genuinely think that art can produce that in people like if you were walking around a neighborhood and then like i guess in your case like there's like a a house with a giant black mural and you're like what the heck is that and then it makes you <laughs> like think for a second you just um, does like I, I i was in berlin recently to work on the app actually and um like there's just there is there's just a lot more public art in berlin and i was just like man this yeah. just feels cool like it just yes it just, it just makes my day a bit better like it's just a bit it's uplifting you know. like you're just more likely to be positive you're more likely to be kind or generous or give someone the benefit of the doubt when they cut you off or whatever the heck it is like you know you're just like um more more positive to the extent aside from burning man which i understand like you know i mean that that would be uh like a singular experience are there american cities that actually are like not terrible at this where you go and you're like okay like th this place kind of reminds me of <laughs> of berlin in that think. way or something like that i'm trying to think um I mean, there's cities like Detroit or Baltimore or Montreal where there's just a lot of abandoned stuff. And so there's a lot of like cool sort of illegal spaces where artists are residing. Um, uh, like I, I'm less familiar with this now, but more like when I was in my like super uh, whatever underground touring days. Um, and it's not like pu public, but I it, it is like sick. Like you know. Detroit, there are murals everywhere because there are like yeah. uh, there are buildings that have fallen into uh, blight and disrepair, and no one cares what the heck you do. So there are people going or even around Miami street. during Art Basel, which I think they paint over the murals during the year. I'm not sure, but like it's sick to just like blocks and blocks of murals. It just it's just I'm like this is nice, you know. It's just cool. And then they were, they were kind of having mural painting parties too, where people were painting murals and there'd just be a bunch of people sitting around like drinking and like chilling, like while the artists were painting the murals. And I was like, I don't know, it's just nice. Like if I had a Sunday afternoon off and I was walking around and I saw someone painting a mural, like I'd probably sit there and watch and hang out. <laughs> like nice, it's like a community, a community building vibe exercise. Yeah, in your case, you'd probably sit there and be like, you know what, you should probably go in this direction over there. And they'd be like, oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't want to backseat drive. That's the worst when someone's like, if I'm DJing and people come up with requests, I'm like, oh, 
you know, you don't want to backseat drive to other people's art. <laughs> <You're> being, <laughs> like, just, enjoy, just enjoy my vision. Get yeah. back to the dance floor. <laughs> Have you wanted to be athletic? Have you also wanted to be green? Then we've got the product for you, Athletic Greens. Uh, what, is, what is Athletic Greens? It's a nutritional supplement. Uh, what it is, is it's a mix you put in with water and all of a sudden all of these super vitamins and minerals and probiotics and everything that they've scientifically engineered to be that supplement that you've been waiting for, that's Athletic Greens. I got to say, you take it uh, it becomes part of a ritual and then you feel like you did your body good and your body returns the favor. Your body's like, ooh, what is this you have given me? This is unusual. This is stimulating. Uh, and then you feel better. And then you do it on the regular and all of a sudden it feels like you're on a much more complete diet. It's kind of a hack. I'm sort of a, um, I'm sort of someone who likes to do things efficiently and Athletic Green is a very efficient way to get the nutrients you need uh, in a way that you can actually do. So... If you're looking to upgrade your multivitamin to take one nutritional formula that's going to help cover you every single day, check out Athletic Greens. It makes getting high quality nutrition incredibly easy, all in one product. Go to athleticgreens.com yang. You'll receive up to a year's supply of liquid vitamin D for free with your first purchase. Ooh, free liquid vitamin D. It's like sunshine in a bottle. Again, that's athleticgreens.com yang. So I have only recently discovered K-pop because, you know, I'm like like an adult dude or whatever. <laughs> but uh, uh, but now that I've discovered it, oh my gosh, like I'm convinced that they, they've done, they've like discovered parts of our brains <laughs> that they've like activated something really uh, primal and, and fundamental in us where you can just watch that stuff and, and just like, like almost fall into like a trance. <laughs> like a... I, I feel like I was thinking about this the other day. I, I was talking to my friends the other day and about I like my friend like was doing some art and she was like, Oh, but it's so wholesome and there's no dark. And it was just this really like everything was like pink and stuff. And I was like, I don't know, dude, like, I feel like this is like radically wholesome and it's like being wholesome is actually sort of like, especially in art is sort of looked down upon and like, you're supposed to be a tortured artist or whatever but it's like it's actually kind of um uh edgy to be wholesome at this point and i sort of feel like with k-pop sometimes it's just it's like radically wholesome like it's just like nothing about it is abrasive and like i think that's actually like kind of a good thing like i, I feel like we almost like don't have enough of that like it's it's like nice to just like know I'm going to like vibe in and engage with something that's just going to like sound great. It's going to look great. It's going to be positive. It's like about love. Like there's like dancing, like it's just, and it's just going to be executed at a flawless level. It's like, I feel like it's, it's sort of a, well, I, I was going to say underrated, but clearly not anymore. Um, well, it, it's but, like the artists are kind of frozen in time at a particular age and stage. Uh, you know, if you had to trace the age, you'd say something like 16 to 26. I mean, I don't know if that's actually how old they all are. Um, and and then the, the music's aimed at a particular demo that's, you know, kind of similar. But it's also kind of frozen in time. Like, it reminds me of Michael Jackson and then Bruno Mars on top of Michael Jackson, or at least that BTS song that now is on the radio everywhere, um, <laughs> where... Um, where there, to me, and this, this betrays, you know, I grew up in the eighties or whatever, but it, it gives me like this wholesome eighties vibe. Uh, and I happen to have been in my teens during the eighties. So, <laughs> so, so it's like, it's like transporting back to, um, to, to that point. I think Elon and I are like, not, you know, like around the same age, I guess he, he might have a year or two on me. Um, so, uh, so I, I feel like they've really figured they've like decoded something. They, you know, and I mean, they've, they've now formed this billion dollar creative industry, like powerhouse industry, um, uh, out of Korea. Um, did you see the Blackpink documentary that's on Netflix? It's like about the kind of training and formation. No, there's a Blackpink documentary on Netflix. Yeah. Wow, and I, you really I watch that. Yeah. Like, but so that they're like, it's, it's great and mostly wholesome and the rest of it, but it also shows the way these girls and they were girls at the time. I got identified and recruited and trained at essentially this boot camp that goes 12 hours yeah. a, a day, like 13 out of 14 days <laughs> where, where they get taught how to 
sing, dance, speak Korean, uh, like generally traffic in this way. And, and like, the, and it also talks about how girls get weeded out on the regular, like they're, they're there. And then, um, you know, the person that they were brought in with disappears and, and like they, they come up and they're, they're training for this debut. Um, and they're training for this debut, like five years later or whatnot. Like they have the, this archival footage of them showing up as, uh, 16 year olds or whatever it is. And then they're like debuting at, uh, 21, um, it's, a, you're going to love it. Like, is, you know, you're going to know, okay, you know, a, a I, that, that is like, you know, yeah, that's the directly exactly what I'm looking for at this moment in time. Holy cow. Can they dance? Like they can dance yeah. like freaking, um, they're almost like AI. The entire thing actually K-pop kind of reminds me of AI. <laughs> it's, well, it's I like, mean, I think they're just, they're just really well trained. Um, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of like the, the, the Beyonce thing or whatever. They're just trained from a young age. So they're just like actually super pro like a lot of musicians like me or a lot of the people i know like like i was 24 when grimes kind of took off you know and i had put like very little effort into training as an artist or you know i'd never even taken a single oh, look life. at this grimes one oh, of the hey. boys just emerged. look at this how's this it going christopher, christopher <laughs> grimes run away christopher Slimes. grimes <laughs> is daddy's friend <laughs> One thing that I know you were inspired by from one of your early albums, which I was a fan of too, was Dune. For you, was Dune the book, the early movie? Like, what what was it? Because you're one of your early yeah. albums. You were pretending to essentially craft a soundtrack for Dune. You were like, oh, if this was if, if this was my soundtrack to it. Well, the tragedy of my life. So, like, my dream as a child, like, I was like, I want to be the, I want to direct the Dune movie. And like, even as a child, I always had. I actually like. I respect a lot of things about the David Lynch movie, but it's not. This pro maybe this is sort of like you know, I'm not supposed to no, say this. I don't love the David Lynch movie. Um, uh, I super love the book. Like my, I, I read the book when I was really young. Like my dad started reading it to me when I was like five or six, and then I just like got obsessed with it and just like finished it like when I was like six or something. So it, it, it it's this very formative experience to me. Um, uh, but. Yeah, I think Dune is like phenomenal, phenomenal. I know it's like, I guess, sort of problematic in some ways or, you know, um, but uh, I'm actually really excited about the new movie. At first I was like extremely bitter and I was like, fuck Danny Villeneuve and blah, 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 or whatever. But you, honestly, the casting you is him? great. You, huh? you probably wrap around a lot of these circles. Have you met um, Danny Villeneuve or any of these guys? No, I've never met him. I may be saying his name wrong, but I recently. I just uh, copied you. FYI. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like weirdly, Timothy Chalamet is actually like a great actor. Um, and like Zendaya, like, like, I don't know. Honestly, the casting in Dune is like almost perfect. Like it's probably what I would have done. So, but I'm so sad that it's been postponed. It was like my, I was literally, I was like, I was like, this is like the light at the end of the tunnel, like of the pandemic was going to Dune. Like, and I was, you know, going to rent out a theater for all my friends and everyone cosplay as a character from Dune. Um, and I was going to be like a sandworm or an artistic interpretation of a sandworm. Um, but yeah, huge tragedy that that film release has been delayed. What, um, what a glorious vision of this uh film premiere or the private film premiere like i, I hope this comes to pass just delayed you know, because like the, yeah. the the you and the um sandworm th uh, costume would be funny they'd, 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 there'd be a lot of funny things to be had um are you a dune fan? Like, um i'm a dune fan from the book uh the the movie didn't do much for me which is yeah. kind of funny um but i love the world building of the book uh, and uh, I think that it was almost, it was very, very hard to make a good movie about that book, um, given filmmaking capabilities <laughs> of like the eighties and whatnot. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, I, I, one of the things that I love about doing that I think is so interesting is it's, it's like so far in the future, but it's sort of post-technological, you know, like AI is banned, thinking machines are banned. And so like people are doing yeah. sort of crazy mind enhancement and stuff to like make up for, um, you know, the technology bans, which is really, really interesting to me, um, especially because like, I do worry we might get into a situation where like governments might start banning technology. Um, 
Like, I think a lot of like the tech boom has been amazing, but also has been quite irresponsible from a safety perspective. And it like, you know, I'm worried if the degree to which, like if the irresponsibility continues, we might get into a place where like, we're shutting down technology, like, cause we just- No, like, no, it's a real, it's, I mean, r right now that's like the, the overreaction that everyone can see coming. Uh, because right yeah. now there, there's so many people that do not feel like they're getting included by technologies uh, forward advancement. Uh, and th there is something happening where uh, where technology is consuming more and more of our time, more and more of our kids' time. Um, are you on TikTok? Um, n on and off, I do find the algorithm to be unsafely addictive. So I'm- Bingo, that's where we, I was going with it. Yeah, it, Wait, was I that, texting you about that, the that... Humane Technology Center for Humane Technology? Yeah, we were talking about Tristan yes. Harris. Yeah, um, yeah, totally. Yeah, and you know, I, I think for example, like I was listening to a podcast with Trist Tristan Harris and I'm, I think it's Tristan, whatever, I'm saying his name wrong. Tristan, um, that's right. And, um, you know, the guy who invented the endless scroll, uh, you know, and it's just like, like a lot of this stuff is like really addictive and also yeah. sort of like um, prioritizes hysteria and rage um, and also just uh, misinformation. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's like leading to not only like a political crisis, but a mental health crisis. Um, yes, on both counts. You know, I, I was also I was reading this thing about how like you go on Twitter or whatever, and you your brain is kind of getting the social chemicals and you're like, feel like you're getting the social time, but you know, you're not like, there's different hormonal releases when you're actually in a room with real people, you know? And it's like, you're, you're actually, you feel like you're getting social, a social experience, but you're really not. And, and so it's like, people are kind of having the byproducts of being quite isolated, okay. um, not to yep. mention just the lack of sleep, like, you know, like these things, like you're on your phone late at night, like it's going to be harder to sleep. Like I think sleeping pill usage is going way up, yeah. you know, which is leads to less REM sleep, blah, 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 blah. And all of this like feeds into like mental health crisis on top of, you know, all the polit political stuff and everything. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's quite concerning. And, I, you know, I was thinking the other day, I, I was talking to some people the other day um, about how, it, you know, it's like, we have global warming and then we have all these global warming scientists or whatever, or like we have pandemic and then we have all these pandemic scientists, but then we have tech and then there isn't like a tech safety community that's super large. Like it's quite small. It's quite oh God, the extent that it exists, it's tiny. Like it's Tristan, yeah. the people that he has on the podcast. And that, that's well, a I lot think of there's, it. I think there's like Oxford, there's like some stuff at Oxford, like I there, but it's still, it's like, it's just not, a, it, you know, it's interesting that, when people consider career in tech, it's it's all sort of like making the tech and none of it is the sort of like the stuff about the making the guardrails. Technology. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, especially like when we're getting close to AI and talking about AI, you know, it's like, it's going to be super important to have like as many people working on AI safety as the, as much as we actually just building AI. Um, well, this um, is one of the things I said on, on, on the trail Grimes is that I said, look, some of the most powerful technologists in the world have said to me that they want guardrails on AI because all the incentives right now are to go as fast as possible because we're competing against yeah. each other and the Chinese, and one of us is gonna do something very regrettable. Uh, and and so I would say to folks, it's like, look, if Elon is saying this or uh, Sam Altman is saying this, then we really need to listen because these are not people that frankly generally request guardrails, <laughs> you know, like, like that. that's not yeah, really yeah, like- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, exactly, like, like you know, they yeah um uh i mean one of the things that really concerns me about the state of the government right now um you know at the risk of sounding ageist is we just have a lot of people in the government who are like very old they didn't grow up with the internet they're not super tuned into technology like you know there's people who are like getting their they're not even checking their email like in congress they, and stuff they might never have checked their email in their entire life life yeah like their, uh, their it, emails it, get printed out and they read the paper and then like yeah, sit, you know and it's just, it's just like this is like really concerning like i don't think the government across the board has any understanding of technology and that's part of the reason the facebook situation is so out of control we can all see it's happening and you don't want to be a jerk to be like oh like you know the olds don't get this stuff but the, the fact is the average age of a U.S. senator is 62. So, like, how many 62-year-olds you know that like understand <laughs> like the mechanics yeah. of these yeah, social exactly. media companies? Um, very few. And 
uh, there has not been independent guidance on technology related issues in the US Congress since 1995, you know, 25 yes. years. So yes. so they're completely out to lunch on this set of issues. Uh, it's corrosive for our democracy. It's corrosive for our mental health. Uh, and, and I've experienced these social media apps in a particular way where uh, I ran for president and tried to use these apps to the best of my ability to make my case and uh, compete and generate a following. Uh, and so I've benefited from them tremendously. Um, yes. Yep. But I, same. I, I rely on them completely to run my business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I can very, very clearly see the downsides for users uh, where I think that I'm unusually good on them. And even for me, sometimes like I, I sense myself lapsing into like a Twitter vortex or, or like, a, you know, like an hour or two will pass. Um, and, yeah, yeah. and and then I'll look up and be like, oh, wait, like I was supposed to do this other thing. And it feels like you're being productive in a particular way and social in a particular way. Well, so you do um, reward, but, you know, the way it's been set up, like as Tristan Harris or whatever says, like it's, it's just reward, it's reward like, ooh, like you hit the heart and you go blue, like, it, you know, like the scroll, like there's, it's so set up visually to just like make your brain just be like, like tuned in and, it, you know, it does, it does feel semi-productive or, you know, you're like, oh, I'm learning things, I'm learning things, but it's like a very shallow um, comprehension. You know, if you're getting a one sentence on a thing, it's like, ooh, like a fact, like, are you even going to remember that? And there's no deep knowledge there. Um, which, and I'm not saying this, like, I don't want to say social media is all bad. Social media obviously is great. And, you know, there's been a lot of like political organizing and stuff on it. So, you know, it's, it's definitely like, I'm not just saying like, you know, fuck social media, but, but, um, but, but there, are, there are excesses and the excesses are hitting teenage girls particularly hard. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the beauty yeah. stuff I, I think is like c concerning. Um, and I believe that that TikTok is the most powerful of these in its own way. Like I just got on TikTok maybe um, two weeks ago, <laughs> three weeks ago. <laughs> and holy cow, is that stuff powerful? Like you you get in there and uh, it's it's hypnotic. Uh, you know, you just end up seeing these videos of human beings <laughs> like like dancing. I mean, humans and... love like humans are trained to want to look at human faces. You know, it's like like consider the amount of portraits versus landscapes. You know, in the, the lineage of painting, um, like we want to look at humans. Like we're you know, I I, th yeah. I I think it behooves most any adult who wants to understand what's going on with the younger generation to try and spend a few hours on TikTok just to see what the heck the kids are doing. Um, because it's like another language. It's like another visual and digital language. Uh, it's got a different energy and vocabulary, different people. Uh, you know, it's like, it, it's fascinating because like, you know, I've been on Twitter now for a little bit and all the media and the journalists are on Twitter and then you go on TikTok and it's like just actual like kids having fun. <laughs> yeah. you know? I think it's great for music. For you, for music, it would be, I'm sure like a, a really useful fire hose. You could just like turn it on and like um, get stimulation in a particular way. Well, it's sort of, a, I think a more natural, I mean, maybe there are, you know, the dark forces of major labels pushing certain songs or whatever. But like, I, as far as I'm aware, like I feel like it's just people like dig a song, a song has a cool vibe with a certain movement. And then like that song can kind of take off in a natural organic way. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, Cause music is super over gate kept. And I like, I think TikTok doesn't have that. I don't know. I might be wrong, but there's a music discovery element, and there are like undiscovered artists who are just making their stuff there. Uh, and yeah, yeah, and, and getting found. Are you gonna run again? Do you think? Uh, I'm almost certainly gonna run for something at some point. I, I've been pretty yeah. public about that, um, and I dare say it would be more fun the second time than the first time because we'd start at a higher base. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but the, the problems are just getting bigger and hairier and nastier. And I just want to try and solve them for your son, for my sons, for everyone's kids. Um, because you and I are in a position where we're actually more able to make a difference in the world than, frankly, you know, like the vast, vast majority of folks. And so, uh, like, I take that responsibility to heart. So, yeah, you're going to see Andrew Yang on some ballot somewhere, some campaign. Um, I've got a couple of uh, visions. Uh, but first things first, you know, we, we have 
Um, right now, this this might be too uh, uh, too nitty gritty for you, but we're, we're heading to Georgia for the Senate races, uh, trying to win the Senate for oh, yeah. for the Dems. Yeah, and then. Uh, you know, and, and then uh, I may end up in the administration trying to tackle some of these social media problems you're talking about. Um, because... That would be cool. Yeah. If you if you if that does end up happening and you end up like, I don't know, like working with the Center for Humane Tech people or anything like that, like and you need any help, definitely hit me up. Hit I will up hit you whatever. up. That would be so fun, Grimes. What we do is we'd have this, um, you know, this message that we need to get out. Um, and then you could help, amp you could like make some freaking incredible uh, creative for it. Um, we'll hit you up on that for, for sure. Look at that. You could be like the champion of the, of the humane technology movement or the human tech movement. I would love it. Cool. Yeah. Well, anyway, I can help. Just let me know. Thank you for listening in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you did, please do subscribe to Yang Speaks and click on notifications so we can let you know every time we have a new episode. 